So we're not the leader, but we're on track to be. Quote, those creating the right conditions for future global status. <laughs> the participation award, most improved. <laughs> Good morning, investors. Bradley here from Watson Estates, and thank you for joining us. You're listening to the largest, fastest growing podcast for Toronto real estate on iTunes, Spotify, and Google Podcasts. If you missed our last episode, we talked about the things, the predictions that we had for 2021, looking at current events and things going on. But based on the news today, as an investor and a broker, I'm analyzing to see what's going on because I want some clarity for myself and for my clients. And I think today is a good time for us to look back at 2020 as hindsight is 2020 and to see what exactly transpired and what does this mean moving forward? So we're gonna start off with what are the Toronto real estate highlights of 2020 and along the way, I'm gonna sprinkle new things, new ideas that are gonna impact our future and should we tax vacant homeowners and tax them hard? This is a conversation happening at the municipal level. We've talked about this as well in past podcasts but it's coming very, very soon. And are Toronto developers developing the wrong stuff? <laughs> and you know me, we like to have some fun. Yesterday, my wife and I were talking. Every so often, we catch up, which is great. It's hard when you got young kids. And she's telling me about how she won a Norwex cloth. If any of you never heard of Norwex, don't worry. Your wife has probably heard of it. But it's this product that you can clean with just water. Like, there's no chemicals or whatever. <laughs> All these toxic things. And she's like, it's great. I can have the kids clean the windows. And I don't have to worry about... And I'm like, I'm never really worried about that stuff. But that's cool. Good for you. Right? What a claim. What a claim. I can clean with just water. Okay. False advertising. <laughs> Need I remind you that the Dyson ball cleaner was very misleading. <laughs> we like to have some fun. Please leave a comment and a like down below. And every so often I get a message from you guys. I love connecting with you guys online. So let's go. We're going to start off with torontostories.com article called Toronto Stories Real Estate Newsmaker of the Year COVID-19. And I'm not going to go to every little topic because the whole point of this show is to summarize what I'm learning, what I'm reading, and to really bring you the best parts. So they break it down into the different aspects of our market. The first thing they point out is the resale market is on fire. Specifically, we also have technology has supported the real estate market, which I think is kind of cute. They say, despite the ongoing pandemic and the introduction of all these new safety protocols, the market came roaring back quickly and observers were stunned. At first, real estate observers chalked it up as pent up demand, but growth looks to continue to the end of the year and even into next. Thank you, technology. <laughs> Thank you, e-signatures. All of these things exist pre-COVID, but apparently this was a revolutionary time for the old folks in the real estate industry. <laughs> and they say this, we are on track as far as numbers to reach a forecast 90,000 to 100,000 sales. In 2020, the demand is strongest for detached and semi-detached and townhomes as opposed to apartments, condos. We'll talk about those in a minute. The latest TREB numbers show home sales in the GTA, GTA up 24.3% compared to the same time last year. If you've been following our channel, it's nothing new, but quite noteworthy, no? Like if we can get sales numbers with COVID up almost 25%, that is crazy. The next trend that they point to is this flight from the core. As people working from home were cooped up, often with spouses or roommates or children also at home, space both inside and outdoors became a more coveted commodity. But I wanna to point to this, this is the truth. Although industry observers note this was not due solely to the pandemic, let me say that again, this was not due solely to the pandemic. There had already been a growing trickle, especially millennials, looking for more affordable homes with more space as they started families and were priced out of Toronto. One question that still remains is whether people will return to work in downtown offices. That, whatever the solution is to that, that's where you're gonna find your answer. If, if, you, if you believe people will come back to the city, good for you. In fact, in a survey released from PricewaterhouseCooper back in September, they found 78% of employers expected at least a partial return to the office, while one in five employees said they wanted to go back to their workplace full-time. And I've actually since then seen stats that say it seems more like 50-50. But don't think, so for those of you as you're thinking this through, don't think that downtown window cleaning businesses are dead. The ghosts always return. You just need the right squeegee board. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Thanks for tuning in. We have had months where year-over-year -year growth in sales were stronger in the surrounding regions than in Toronto. This balance between the 416 and the 905, we see it. 
Now I want to kind of, this is where I want to look to the future here. I want to jump over to an article that was published area code 416 homes.com where we balance the balance between detached and condos. I think this is an incredible way for us to look at this trend, this idea that people will buy condos and then they'll move up into the detached. Well, here's what they say. I've tracked it back to January, 1996, when the ratio that is detached to condos was 2.00. That is to say the average home for a detached was 270,000 say, which is two times that of a condo apartment at 134,000. Why does this matter? Well, this is a trend he's been mapping out. It says prices have obviously moved a lot since then, but this ratio has more or less held near there. So the fact that although that we have a, there's a price difference, it seems to be consistent since the mid nineties. Interesting. If you looked at the ends of the distribution curve, it only dropped below 1.9 about 10% of the time and only popped above 2.5 about 10% of the time. So it tends to float there. Well, we've just popped above 2.25 again. That is to say people prefer the detach at an unusual rate relative to condos. I find this fascinating. I don't know if you guys do, but it seems like whenever this ratio strays too far, it falls back in line. My, my theory is that once freeholds become too far ahead of condo prices, the ratio gets too much height. People can't trade up anymore and the freehold market stalls. Reminds me of 2017. It really does. Here's his conclusion to that article. At some point, condos are that much cheaper and people start buying them again. They're that much cheaper. Their prices rise again and the ratio drifts back to its normal range. Or at some point, detach, which has its benchmark up 10.1 year over year, will become too far out of reach and people go back to the more affordable condos. Makes me wonder if you could actually invest in real estate just based on these ratios. 2017 was a bit of an unusual one in that it stayed really high for so long, but look at the whiplash that we had. This 2.31 may continue to rise, they say, but I caution that if it gets up in the high twos, I'd say a period of adjustment is looming. Woo! <laughs> Keep that in mind before you get all excited about hosting a Norwex party in your townhouse. <laughs> You might not have it made after all. <laughs> all right. I know sometimes, sometimes my jokes, they don't fit perfectly, right? They're not, they're not clean, <laughs> but at least I don't swear. Otherwise I need to hire a custodian. <laughs> all right. So condos, let's go into condos. I promise we're going to talk about that as we look through 2020. And again, looking to the future, whether in the 416 or 905 ground level homes are hot, but condo demand is not as strong, says Mercer from Treb. This is especially the case in downtown Toronto, a variety of reasons. Quote, if you dig into the data, you'll find that downtown condo sales and prices started declining year over year in October. They started declining. The correction in prices so far compared to March has been about 10% downtown. They're likely still a bit further prices will decline. I saw a post, a Twitter post from Zeland, and I love this analysis. This is what it says. Toronto condo sector is still a buyer's market, but getting closer to balanced territory. So price declines should slow down. That's optimistic news for condo owners out there, but they're saying there's three factors that are supporting condos. Number one, high move up cost. This ratio between detaching condos. Number two, detached overvaluation. Again, much of the same arguments. And number three, an unwillingness to sell below peak prices. If you have any condos, you're probably in this pool as well. It's the reason I think that we stood so well at the beginning of the COVID pandemic. Now the cons in the condo market, as they mentioned here, and as we've talked about on our show, is of course the rental market. The rental market seems to be the, the handcuffs in the condo space right now. Scott Ingram put in his two cents as well. Often condo and freehold sales mirror each other, but what they're doing currently is out of sync as it was in 2015 and 2016 to a degree. Still directionally the same, but condos were at elevated levels. So could we experience in the detached housing segment similar to we did in 2017? My hunch is probably not, but I definitely think that condos are getting dragged through the mud right now. That spread cannot be ignored. Okay, the next thing that they look at, tenants. Tenants get a bit of a break. When we look at the tenants in 2020, it really is a balance of supply and demand. Supply side showing there's been over 100 more units available for lease than in the same time last year. As well, there's been more purpose-built rental apartments as well as more condos coming online, adding to supply. And we know a lot of those buyers are investors. But then we also have the demand side. 
We got a pandemic stopping the flow of immigration, both from other provinces and from outside the country, as well as students, which just hit us in September, leaving many apartments empty. Another consequence of the pandemic has hit people with lower incomes who tend to rent. All of these things make so much sense. How obvious it would have been had we been had a crystal ball at the time. All this adds up to higher vacancy and downward pressure on rental prices for the first time in a long time. And we'll talk about where it's going as well. But how many tenants have paid rent? When we look back in 2020, we see the average 94% of tenants were able to pay in full. 94%. And we've got an eviction ban that ended in September. We talked as that was happening. We announced it when no one else was. And then it took place. But of course, as we still say today, there's a backlog. There's a backlog for these hearings at the LTB. So those things aren't going anywhere anytime fast. So let's look. Zeland posted, if investors continue to hold, I don't expect rental markets to stabilize until at least Q3 2021, which actually seems to line up with what I've said. Those are along my lines of thought too. So far, active inventory is huge. And the only realistic hope is that September 21 students will fill it. Meanwhile, I don't know if I would stand on this hill, but here's what they're saying. Just some food for thought. Meanwhile, rent should continue declining. Rent prices, another, he says, 5 to 7% drop is possible. I don't know. I don't know. I like to think not. I like to think there's a level of support there. But there is a lot of pressure coming in the rental space as we round into 2021. For those who think rental rates have already reached their low, I have a story for you. I was meeting a friend at a smoke shop and accidentally went into the dry cleaners next door. Clothes, but no cigar. (laughs) Mortgage deferrals. Mortgage deferrals. This is a very quick, quick one here. Almost 16% of Canadian holding mortgages. That's 780,000 people deferred their mortgage. And many did so to preserve capital rather than out of desperation. No news under that rock. New buildings. This one we can dive a little bit into. And I'm going to add a bit to it as well. When we look at build, the Building Industry and Land Development Association, Sigal Family Sales this year from a pre-construction standpoint were up 44% from a year ago, which is a 42% over the 10-year average. So very exceptional year in the low rise, but that wasn't the case for everybody. Condo apartment sales were down 32% from a year ago and down 20% from the 10-year average. Night and day, really is. Here's a side story from torontostories.com that I think adds some insight into this. Listen to this title. Toronto had nearly 11,000 more home starts than any other Canadian city in 2020. Wow. (laughs) Toronto is closing out 2020 on top of the list of Canadian cities with the most home starts. That is according to Remax, Toronto is number one on the list by some 10,000 some odd and units and holds the top spot for not only starts, but completions and total absorptions, the speed at which it goes into the market and gets scooped up as well. So there's an incredible demand in Toronto. Sales activity, prices, and demand have all increased. Builders, in other words, they're not desperate. They're really not here in the city. Quote, since most construction projects have been spared the worst of the pandemic, home builder activity has maintained its record-setting strength throughout the public health crisis. If you're looking for a deal, maybe pre-construction is not the place. <laughs> and this is occurring amid the worst economic downturn since the Great Depression, generating discussions that the Canadian real estate industry is immune to public health crisis. Now, if you're, if you're curious, Toronto's number one as far as builds. Vancouver, two. Montreal, three. Edmonton, four. Hamilton, Ontario, number five. Saskatoon, six. And Winnipeg, number seven. These are your big players in the up-and-coming development space. Okay, so what happens next? What happens into 2021 beyond what we talked about in our last episode? What happens next, they say, depends on a variety of factors. And most people are reluctant to predict precise details. (laughs) I mean, what's the worst that can happen? I'm wrong? (laughs) Ooh. (laughs) Man, you guys know me. I have no trouble speaking my mind. The only thing that freaks me out is asking my wife to clean up after cooking breakfast. (laughs) <laughs> I've been walking on eggshells all day. <laughs> Which, Whatever way this ends up playing, they say one thing for sure, we can only hope that our 2021 newsmaker of the year has nothing to do with the pandemic, except maybe that it's gone. <laughs> all right, let's move along. Let's talk about the vacant home tax. Of course, we mentioned this in our last podcast episode, but more information is constantly coming out. More opinions and views of what this would look like are constantly coming out. And today gives me a lot of clarity on the positions that people hold on whether this is actually a good thing for our market. 
hit that subscribe button and hit that like button while I get a chance to recuperate my breath here. <laughs> okay, we're going to start with Better Dwelling because Better Dwelling is notorious for being very critical of our market. So let's see what they think. Here's an article. Toronto will finally get a vacant home tax after bleeding millennials for years. I'm going to save you the intro, but here's what they say. The city's own report, talking about Toronto, found over 10,000 units were almost never used. This has made a sharp contribution to the city's affordability crisis. Therefore, if we resolve it, it's fine. The affordability crisis has actually resulted in a negative flow of young adults, which is a trend that they map out in this article. As Toronto bleeds them to smaller regions and the suburbs, it sends itself up for long-term damage. This trend is likely to have accelerated during the pandemic as Toronto suburbs became buying hotspots. So what you're saying is that a vacant home tax will help Toronto, this is what I'm reading, to the detriment of the suburbs? Okay, is that that's the thought? I don't know. I don't know. God help us. <laughs> God help us clean up this mess. Bring Pope Francis with his papal towels. <laughs> Toronto's vacant home tax. Here's what's proposed, okay? We're proposing 1%. 1%, as we saw Vancouver do not that long ago. City staff officially recommended Toronto adopt a vacant home tax. The tax would start at 1% compared, which is pretty much double the rate of the city's current 0.599% property tax rate. And of course, it's following Vancouver, who has now recently raised it up to 3%. They're seeing so much success with this program. I think the numbers were like 24% of vacant units have actually switched in, Van in Vancouver since this was done. So if the plan is to get the vacant units off the street, it's working. They're proposing a target rollout for the 2022 tax year. The report estimates 1% of housing stock subject to the tax would generate between 55 and $66 million in gross tax revenue annually. Well, there's a win. Could that be the motivation? <laughs> more likely than not, right? 1% they say of housing stock, which is more than rental vacancy in some years, which is kind of a funny, that's a, a critic's approach. So the critics, they like it. They like the vacant home tax. Well, can we all agree on that? Or is there, is there kind of this op opposition that's being formed? Surprisingly, no. This is actually something that everyone seems to agree on. The star.com has an article called Tax Them and Tax Them Hard. It came out literally this morning. Toronto shouldn't be timid about people who let homes sit vacant. Listen to this. Most debates at Toronto City Hall involve a whole bunch of annoying nuances. There are arguments and counter arguments with decent points on all sides. For those of us who write newspaper columns, it makes the job challenging. <laughs> and then I'm trying to explain what the newspapers are saying, which is even more challenging. But listen to this. Sometimes though, we get a lucky break. Occasionally an issue comes along that really is super simple and one-sided, right? They say the correct move is obvious. Tax vacant homes and tax them hard. <laughs> <laughs> That's the lesson. Everybody's on board. I don't see any opposition to this. It works by requiring all property owners to declare whether their property is occupied or vacant with a vacancy defined as homes that are unused for more than six months. And this isn't going to happen right away. It's, been, it's going to happen over the next couple of years. But they say no one is sure yet how many properties in Toronto are vacant. Estimates based on homes with very low water usage, if that's the way to do it, put the number at somewhere between 9,000 and 27,000. <laughs> a modest range right? But the best conclusion comes out of this article. I love, I'm just going to read it because I think it's fantastic. <laughs> and I think it summarizes what most people's view are of these foreign investors buying up these units that are just sitting vacant. Here it is. If people still insist on keeping units empty, tax revenue could add up quickly. But if the tax causes property owners to no longer see Toronto's housing market as a place to park their money, that's fine too. We call these people investors or speculators, but they're really too charitable of a term. They're parasites, extracting wealth from the city while giving almost nothing back. <laughs> a tax can make them pay or it can make them leave. And either way, Toronto will be better off. <laughs> So the conclusion that I would have that's a little more, less aggressive is if you want to invest here, just come. I mean, we have no problem with you moving here too. Join us, join us. Perhaps the solution is right in front of us. The vaccine for our housing market has maybe been found. Good for you, Toronto. But I'm good though. <laughs> I don't need that one. I'm still protected by the ta ta blah. <laughs> There goes my tongue again. It's the Tide Pods. <laughs> I'm good, I had Tide Pods two years ago. Line myself up with a tongue twister. All right, hot topics. Let's go some. Let's cover some hot topics before we get into the development. First thing is good news. 
first coronavirus vaccine shots could be doled out in Canada next week. Justin Trudeau announced Monday that Canada has secured an agreement with Pfizer coronavirus vaccine before the end of the year, up to just under 250,000 doses. Woohoo! That's a good thing. Thought I'd lead with a bit of uh, optimistic news. Globe and Mail had another article. Sophisticated investors are desperate to buy Canada's apartment buildings. Values soar despite COVID-19. We talk a lot about the housing market, you know, low rise, condos, even the rental space. And I like to play in the apartment space as an investor myself. And so I thought, you know what, this is a good way for me to shed some light on what that looks like right now. Listen to this. Intense demand for Canadian apartment buildings has come roaring back despite the pandemic. Reigniting bidding wars between institutional investors for renting towers across the country. Recognize there's a lot of competition. With private buyers lining up in spades again, older properties have become prized assets, especially those with recent vacancies due to COVID. The buildings tend to charge rent far below market rent, which is a quick way to get forced appreciation, which we're doing, which gives prospective investors a better chance to quickly increase vacant unit rents once the economy recovers. I just shot actually yesterday with Mark Loeffler, who's an investor in apartment buildings as well and a realtor of 12 years. It's going to be coming out in the next couple of weeks, but he mentioned in that show that he recently went into a bidding war on a Burlington home or apartment with over 40 units, and they had 40 multiple offers. Crazy. While many property deals are private transactions, some recent sales in Midtown Toronto that were completed at capitalization rates around 2%. A 2% cap rate is so low, guys. It's so low, right? They're saying five years ago it was at 5%. And why that matters is the low cap rate means a higher price point. People are accepting a lower return on these units downtown. And why? Because there's so few of them. Because it's Toronto. And why would you not want to invest in the GTA? Right? I'm not going to go too far into cap rates. Um, but I just wanted to show you how lucrative the apartment space is right now. And that is also because we are looking for investors, especially if you're an accredited investor. Hit your boy up. DM me. And uh, we're actually burying these apartment deals because there's so much upside potential. We're trying to get the money back as fast as possible. And if not, even if you're not an accredited investor, at least get into the space. In over five years, you're going to get your money back out. And you're going to own an apartment building. I don't understand why people settle for such small units. And I personally, I love connecting with investors. Wait. Is that hand sanitizer in your pocket? Or are you just happy to be within six feet of me? <laughs> Come on in, guys. Come on in for a group hug. All right, here's some other upcoming changes that I wanted to highlight in our market. This comes from the fall economic statement, a 2020 overview, and it's also highlighted by Zlan on Twitter. Here's some of the things that are noteworthy as we round into 2021. Number one, employment recovery is estimated between 24 to 50 months. Okay, months. And don't expect the printing press to stop. There are huge deficits ahead as we see. Immigration numbers expected to go up. First time home buyer incentive is going up, which we're not covering today, but we've talked about. Airbnb tax. I want to get into this, guys. They are planning on putting an HST on Airbnb, which is super interesting. So they say this, to improve the HST compliance and to ensure fairness across the accommodation sector, the government proposes to apply an HST to all platform-based short-term rental accommodations supplied in Canada. Under the proposal, they'll be required to be collected, HST, and remitted by either the property owner or the digital accommodation platform. And this will be rolled out effective July 1st, 2021. There is another pressure right there on the Airbnb market. So if you had any doubt people were going to be switching, there's another reason to do it. And it just creates a, a fairness. Uh, it allows everyone to compete at the same level. You're not collecting taxes online. That doesn't seem so fair to me. And then there's last one, unproductive foreign and ownership tax. Sorry, that's not the one. We just covered that. But here's the last one. Here's a bonus. Home office, $400 auto approved. So it turns out a lot of people don't know how to keep record of their expenses. And you can get a ton of deductions right now for a home office. It'll save you a lot of money. But if you don't want to go through the headache of collecting receipts and doing all that fun stuff that we as self-employed people do all the time, well, they just allowed people to claim a modest expense of up to $400. Woohoo! 400 bucks. <laughs> the average Canadian can't figure out how to track expenses, so they've just simplified it. Hey, Canada, what's the difference between sanitizer and moisturizer? <laughs> One will burn your eyes. The other will moisturize. <laughs> so dumb so dumb right just keep your receipts man you got so much more than 400 bucks just settle don't settle i mean think of all the expense i mean i don't want to get into that okay moving on sub one percent mortgage rates come to canada you've probably seen this. this is big headlines hsbc effective december 4th is now offering a 99.99 percent interest rate what what 
I, I had to like blink a couple times just to make sure my eyes were working. Variable rate for high ratio insured purchases only with a discount equivalent of prime minus 1.46. Here's crazy. They got other products too. It's not even just that. That's just the headline. They got a 1.39 on a five-year fixed for high ratio mortgages, which is a record low. 1.59 on five-year fixed uninsured purchases and switches. 1.59, guys. We're in the mid ones here. We're in the mid ones. Man. Anyways, you can check out some of their things. And here's the thing. That's not even a not, that's not even a limited offer. That is just, that's just their new rate. It's not going to expire. There's no expiry on these rates. So two things that I've learned this year. Number one, Rates can always go down more. <laughs> Number two, not all germs are from Germany. <laughs> there was an article from Steve Sureski talking about the article is called "Business is Booming." Residential mortgage growth, if you weren't, if you were curious, is now humming near six percent, a rate of growth we haven't seen since back in 2017. Again, this seems to be a pattern, right? We're, we're really imitating what 2017 looked like, and that things are growing so quickly. Is there going to be a relapse? I don't know. But he says, if you want to figure out what direction the housing market is headed, just watch the bankers responsible for creating the loans. The mortgage business is booming even in a pandemic. There's three things he says he's watching. Number one is consumer insolvencies are plunging. They really are. You got little charts on here. It's crazy. They're dropping like, like flies. And then we've got printing prosperity. Canadian households are flush with cash. The, the real household income per capita, disposable income, is 11%. The U.S. is 10. The next highest is like like 5.3, like they're, where we're like astronomical as far as the amount of disposable income per capita. The other thing he's tracking is the amount of support programs, which has really saved our market. In fact, we're sitting at $320 billion in federal support programs. The government, yeah, they cleaned us up. They didn't use the water stuff. They didn't use Norwex. I'm not being paid by these guys, by the way. <laughs> I should be. <laughs> But they sure did clean up house, even though they didn't use the, the, the environmentally friendly stuff. Which reminds me of a time my wife and her sister went to town scrubbing the house when we first moved in. My wife's name is Sandra. I call her my Sandertizer. And her sister-in-law, her name is uh, Antibacterial. <laughs> These guys, I'll tell you, clean freaks. <laughs> Yours can be too for the low cost of, I don't even know. All right, moving on. CBC.com. I think this is interesting. Because we've got these articles, this big dilemma, as we talked about these MZOs, which is MZOs. If you don't know what that is, it's pretty much the government just squashing any environmental protection to get things done and construction made. Well, now it's come to a head here. We've got six members of Ontario's Greenbelt Council join Crombie and resign, setting proposed new rules. They're like, screw you. You're not listening to us anyways. Here's what they say. His resignation, the top chiefs, the, the leader dudes, resignation comes about as a result of what he describes as fundamental differences of opinion on the province's Greenbelt policy direction. This is what he says. Ontarians can successfully realize the great values and benefits of the Greenbelt through the effectiveness of watershed planning, the strength and resilience of the conservation authorities, and the power of public participation and open debate. All of these things, by the way, getting squashed by these MZOs. It is now clear that the government's direction disastrously assaults all three of these primary conditions. So we've got this big conflict going on right now between Mr. Ford and business and developers and creating new inventory versus the environmental protection group. And who's winning? Well, who's stronger? In this case, the government. Hey, I'm all for caring about the environment, though. But don't get mad when some chemicals get in the water when you clean the dolphins. <laughs> you know, those Lake Ontario dolphins. <laughs> That is, unless you've got a Norwex multi-porpoise cleaner. <laughs> Oh, I like that one. That's fun. All right, moving on. Toronto was just deemed the second fastest rising global city in the world. If you don't think Toronto is the best city as I do in the world, we will be soon. Watch this. Toronto is emerging more and more each year as a leading global city in the eyes of business leaders worldwide. And based on the results of an important annual outlook for 2020, it will only continue to grow in influence. Here's what they did. A.T. Kearney annual global cities outlook puts Toronto at spot number two. Out of 151 cities, we went up a whopping nine places since 2019. We actually beat out London, England. The outlook is described as, quote, a projection of a city's potential based on the rate of change in 13 indicators across four dimensions. Personal well-being, economics, innovation, governance. Not to be confused with the GCI, which indicates current global leaders. So we're not the leader, but we're on track to be. Quote, those creating the right conditions for future global status. <laughs> the participation award, most improved. <laughs> 
All right, let's talk about developing. So as we look to our future, we got developers developing things, but are they developing the right things? Well, some would argue they're developing the wrong stuff. And this all comes from conflict once again with the government. Here's the article from the Globe and Mail. Developers are pumping out studios and one bedroom condos in Toronto's region, even as demand for smaller units has plummeted during the pandemic. Here's the breakdown. 61% of new, con new condo launches in Toronto are studios and one bedrooms. 32% are two bedrooms and 7% are larger. So the vast majority are small. The 61% is a big deal. It's higher than 2019, 2018, and even 2017, which was at 48%. And that's when the residential resale market was surging. Developers went on a building spree and the price of condo per square foot rose 30% amid speculative buying. These are all years we've just knocked out with the, like the splits towards the smaller inventory. But why? Why would they do that? We don't need that. The city wants you to do something else. So what? Today, cost is the main reason developers continue to build smaller. Listen to this. I wasn't going to say this, but it's fantastic and I have to. With construction and development expenses rising, a pre-construction studio in the downtown entertainment district will, ri will run in the high 500s. A one-bedroom mid a one bedroom mid 600 and two bedrooms high 800 to 900 according to some developers those are the prices but here's what they say at the end of the day the price point and sticker price is what drives our market all they care about is making more money i'm gonna make more money for less money why would i not do that that's just smart business yet people look at developers like there's some kind of bacterial disease that reminds me of a joke but i don't want to spread it <laughs> Although municipal governments across the country have encouraged developers to build larger units in a bid to accommodate different family types, Toronto developers said the economics do not work to get the building off the ground. A developer is typically required to sell 75% of its condo project units to get the financing needed, and a large number of pre-construction buyers are investors who are also looking for cheaper units. Makes sense. Makes sense. So once again, we got another conflict, except the government now is in conflict with investors and developers who are looking out for their own self-interest. How dare they? How dare they? I don't find investors are buying bigger units. The biggest thing is the price point. They want bigger spaces, but they can't afford to buy bigger spaces. People aren't looking for it. They're going to deal with what people are going after, which is the low cost units. Sometimes the city is unrealistic. At the end, it becomes a question of dollars. What can the city do? I'll ask you guys to steer investors towards building larger units. I don't know. I don't have a solution for that. Maybe you guys do. If you do, we got a lot of people follow our channel. Maybe it'll seep through the cracks as some other things we've talked about have. But builders, they care about profit. The star.com had an interesting article. Listen to this. This is why they exist. Ontario needs better consumer oversight on everything from condos and coffins to cannabis, Auditor General says. Obviously, I'm not focusing on cannabis, <laughs> but we're going to focus on condos. And there's been problems. They say in our survey of condo owners, we found developers set condo fees increased as much as 30% in the first two years after the condo's registration and as much as 50% in the last five years. So they're setting these prices for condo fees, but they're always low. They're always low. The Condominium Authority of Ontario lacks the ability to inspect or investigate potential abuses or misconduct by condo boards or investigate non-compliance and enforce compliance with the relevant legislation and regulation. Is that what we need? Do we need more legislation and regulation? I don't tend to believe in that, but don't expect to build, don't expect the businesses, the developers to do that themselves. And Scott Ingram added to this argument. He said that he did an investigation a few years ago from the sales office to the registration and found that 97% of condo projects underestimated the condo fee and the average underestimate was 20%. So when you're going approaching those developers because you think you're getting a deal on those pre-construction units and you're way being way undersold what those maintenance fees are going to be, then you give your boy a call and say, let's make some big guap, homie. <laughs> but until the government steps in, why would developers change their tune? I know I wouldn't. Ugh. We're going to start to wrap up here. Hit the subscribe button, guys. But I'm going to leave you guys off on a fun note. With the end of COVID in sight, because it really is just a week away, potentially. We're all in this together. And to all the cleaners out there working tirelessly to keep our hospitals and workplaces clean, I have one thing to say to you. You missed the spot. <laughs> I hope you guys had some fun today. Please leave us a, a review down below. Let us know your thoughts and I'll see you next time. Take care and keep it real.